All right. So How's everybody we're doing? I'm Travis Hooven. <laughs> I'm Sarah DeCroce. Adam Tarowski. And our project was student perception of GMOs and their prevalence on campus. Uh, quick shout out first. Our, we were advised by Dr. Beeser and Dr. Conley who are sitting here and, and a somewhat of a partnership with Airmark and Jamie Dining Services. So thank you to all of those people. So today we'd like to start with a brief outline of exactly what we will talk about. Uh, first, we get into an introduction of background, which deals with GMO history, genetic modified organisms, that is, of course, which then dives us into the labeling policy, which is highly debated, as we all know. And after that, that really sparked our interest, so we get into our actual project. We talk about our purpose, which was separated into three different areas, which was the prevalence around campus of GMOs, the student perception of GMOs, and then a final analysis of our data. After the purposes and our scope, we go to our methods of exactly how we achieved our goals. And finally, our all-important results we, of course, get to, and then our conclusions and recommendations for our analysis. As you can see from the picture, that is us working very hard in the lab. <laughs> we wear lab coats every time. <laughs> so first we get into a background and introduction regarding genetically modified organisms. This is a good history about it. So technically, an astounding fact is that we've been modifying organisms for over 30,000 years. Well, actually, it's not 100% true because we've been selectively breeding plants, which me that means. A more modern definition came about in 1973 with Herbert Boyer and Stanley Cohen. They created the first genetically modified organism, which was a modified bacteria. Is it working now? Yes, it is. Good to go. Okay. You. you got it. Thank you. Okay. Anyway, though, so the first modified bacteria was made in 1973, and over the next 20 years saw the birth of the biotechnology industry, as well as GMOs becoming more prevalent all over. For our project, we really wanted to focus on genetically modified foods, especially around the campus, which we focused on plants. So in 1992, our biggest breakthrough was the United States Department of Agriculture approved the first genetically modified crop. That was called the Flavor Saver Tomato, which was a modified tomato to extend its shelf life. Uh, unfortunately for us, the public did not like eating anything that was modified in the early 90s, so that never worked out. But a couple years later came the birth of the genetically modified agriculture industry with pesticide resistant crops, like we call Roundup Ready, which you can spray an herbicide on the crop and it will not kill it. Also came about is the BT toxin plants, which you, an insect would eat the plant and then die. This was called like BT corn, we also known as that. So because of today, most of our foods and a lot of our foods are modified, there's many cultural dynamics surrounding the project. We did some research and found that the public opinion <coughs> from before our, our aspect, our, our perception, was that they have little information, they have common <coughs> misconceptions, and that they associate different long-term negative health effects with GMOs. But that is not proven. And also the government found that this was such a highly uh, debated issue that they did a meta-analysis survey that basically just proved what we thought and said most people have some concerns about foods containing genetically modified ingredients. So because this issue was building and building about GMOs in the United States, <coughs> there was a finally a 2016 GMO labeling bill that was passed. But we will get into that because it's not yet enacted. So currently our policy around genetically modified organisms labeling is that it's considered a coordinated framework between many governmental organizations, the United States Department of Agriculture, the Food and Drug Administration, the Environmental Protection Agency, those three. They consider GMOs to be generally recognized as safe and then that they do not need to be labeled at all because that they, do, they consider them to have no material difference between their non-modified counterparts. Basically, they do not differ in, as you can see, their structure, function, or composition. So because of the FDA's ruling that they do not need to be um, labeled, there are many labeling initiatives that came about because they really wanted labeling. The largest was in California, which was in 2012. They had their Proposition 37, and all of the people, and they all wanted their right to know exactly what they were eating. Unfortunately for them, the bill was voted down, as well as many other states, which Vermont was the only state that fully was approved mandatory labeling. But that actually was never in effect because of the new labeling bill. So the reason, you may be wondering why all of these bills were voted down, is mainly because 
the, this lawsuit that happened, which is the Alliance for Biointegrity versus Shalala, and that featured a group of scientists and religious leaders protesting the FDA's ruling that GMOs do not need to be labeled. This went all the way to the Supreme Court, and they stated finally that they supported the FDA's ruling, they do not need to be labeled, because they found no material difference, like we said earlier, between modified foods and non-modified foods. On the other hand, we, an we an analyzed our other stakeholders that there were critiques against labeling. So many large corporations, like farmers, seed manufacturers, and especially the grocery stores, said that if you would label a, a GMO, they'd imply a negative health aspect, which then has a downturn of effects, which create an unnecessary panic, and then lead to a negative effect on the economy. And many of the grocery stores and seed manufacturers also said that, that it is not feasible to label everything where you draw the line. This created a huge outroar. outroar. So finally, a, our government stepped in on July 29, 2016. It was passed by Congress, signed by President then, Barack Obama, and it was called the Safe and Accurate Food Labeling Act, which is a mandatory labeling of all GMOs. So basically, we're not exactly sure yet be, of, it, of what this bill means, because there was an agreement that in two years, there will be another agreement that will come between the USDA and other industry leaders. But there were a few options that were stated for labeling. The first would be a to be determined symbol that can be placed on the packaging. The second would be a 1-800 phone number, which you would call to receive information. And the third would be a QR code, which you can scan on your smartphone, and that would take you to information regarding that product's modification. So all of this builds up, which sparked all, of, all three of our interests to finally creating this project and doing this regarding student perception of GMOs. We set out to achieve three different goals. Our first was to understand students' perception of GMOs, gain laboratory experience by testing for them around campus, and then present a feasible plan and data analysis to our partners, which was Aramark and JMU Dining Services. We had a scope of only JMU's campus and the population, because if we were to take it any further, we'd get a little crazy. So we decided just to do it here. To achieve our three goals, we decided to split up into three different areas. Our first area for student perception was creating a survey, which was distributed. Our second, to find the prevalence around campus, was laboratory testing. And our third, for our data presentation, was with Airmark and JMU Dining Services. And Airmark, by the way, is JMU's food provider. So that's what we say when we mean that. Before our project was even underway, we actually had to gain approval. We did not want to step on anybody's toes. So on October 3rd, we met with the resident district manager of Aramark and had a presentation telling her what our project goals were, and we were approved fully 100% that we could do achieve all of our goals and purposes. We met with them and JMU Dining Services several times to gain information throughout the year. And then before our laboratory testing, we on uh, February 1st, 2017, we met with the JMU Health and Wellness Manager to uh, get our information and then so we can um, get laboratory our foods from eHall for laboratory testing. We tried to use proper sterile methods when we gained the, got the foods from eHall and we also for laboratory testing picked our most the most popular foods that were on the menu every single day so we can really gain a good area of testing. And also we picked everyone's favorite like things uh, like buffalo mash and then pizza. But bef so before we could uh, before we did the laboratory testing we had gained all the research and approval, we actually submitted, did a survey, which Travis will talk about our survey. All right, so this is the survey we sent out uh, regarding the student perception of GMOs. Um, we tried to be as unbiased as possible. We tried to structure the questions in a way that wouldn't lead students down picking one way or the other during the survey. Uh, we even did research on other surveys that have been put out in the past to see what questions they were asking and how they worded them to get tips for ourselves for our own survey. Um, since we were technically doing research on human subjects, we had to get uh, approval from the Institutional Review Board here at JMU, which we did. Uh, there's our protocol number. We got approval on December 7th, 2016, and that was valid till April 14th, 2017. Uh, we sent the survey out for the first time via email on January 20th, 2017, and for the second time on February 6th, 2017. Uh, these are the questions we asked in the survey, uh, including graduation year, college, um, understanding on GMOs, whether they think they're safe or not. We asked a, 
a load of questions for him. Uh, since JMU has a, a population of roughly 20,000 students, uh, for our survey we wanted a confidence level of 98% and a confidence interval of 5%. That mean, it means we needed a sample size of 527 responses. And that brings us to the results of the survey. As you can see, we got 556 responses, so we met our quota. Uh, no surprise here, 100% consented to take the survey, thankfully, like nobody <laughs> didn't consent to take the survey. Um, our second question was anticipated graduation year. As you can see, we have a pretty even split here. Not one graduation year answered all, it was all the participants in the survey, so we got a pretty even split, the most of which are graduating this year by a small amount. And we asked what college does our major fall under? Here's the split you can see. Uh, and then we wanted to see if that was an, actual, uh, an accurate representation of the JMU population. Uh, for the College of Business, they were down from their JMU percentage regarding our survey percentage by about 9.5%. Integrated Science and Engineering was up about 10.5%. But as you can see, all the other colleges were all within 2.5%, very close to their actual representation of JMU. So we can confidently say this is a pretty accurate representation of the population here at JMU. Uh, then we wanted to see if this survey was even pertinent. Like, we wanted to know if people were actually eating on campus, so yes, they are. Over 50% of people are eating on campus at least four days a week, and over 75% are eating at least one day a week on campus. And then we asked them to gauge their self-perceived understanding about genetically modified food. Uh, there was a pretty low percentage of people who said they actually had low understanding on the subject. Most were in the medium to high range. Um, we, we have pretty extensive knowledge on the subject about GMOs and genetic modification. We think they're probably overestimating their understanding on the subject, <laughs> honestly. But it is an anonymous survey and it is self-perceived, so there's nothing we can do about that. Uh, and then we wanted to know whether they thought genetically modified food is safe or unsafe. As you can see, we got a pretty, like, dead even split. Like, uh, there was a small majority for safe, but it was right dead, right down the middle. Uh, this was pretty surprising to us given like the bad stigma that hangs over GMOs and how the people, you tend to hear negative things about them. Uh, so yeah, I mean even the small majority thought they were safe. And at this point in the survey we uh, integrated a skip logic. If the participants said that they thought they were safe, GM food was safe, then they skipped this next question. But if they thought they were unsafe, then we wanted to know why, so we gave them this next question. Uh, about why are you concerned about the safety of genetically modified food. Uh, at the top is just the very concerned section. You can see the breakdown of why people are very concerned. And then I, I outlined it for long-term human health for 251 people who answered this question, only two, or about 0.8%, said that they were completely unconcerned about GMOs causing health problems. So that's, I mean, that's pretty telling. I mean, people who are concerned about GMOs really do think they're gonna cause human health problems down the road. Although there is no uh, research right now that says that GMOs do cause health problems. So that's a, a little bit of a misconception. Uh, and then we wanted to know whether they thought there was enough information about genetically modified food on JMU's campus. And as you can see, over 63% of participants said no, there is not enough information. 30% uh, were unsure. Uh, we don't really know what their state of mind is there. They're just unsure about it. But as you can see, the overwhelming majority said no, and a very small percentage said yes. Uh, and then we, because uh, labeling of GMOs is such a hot topic, uh, we wanted to know how often people read the labels on their food products, and over 90% said they at least sometimes read them. So. And then we wanted to know what their preferred option of genetically modified food on JMU's campus is. Once again, the highest total we got was for more educational information regarding the subject. Uh, we also got a good percentage of people say that they wanted genetically modified foods to be labeled, as well as there, a food as well as there to be a food option in the dining halls that contain no genetically modified ingredients, which is already the case in most dining halls, so they got their wish there. And then finally, we wanted to see how likely they were to seek more information about the subject. As you can see, over 65% said that they were likely to seek more information about it. So this had a lasting impact on people. And I pointed out to the bottom, there was 528 responses to this question. 
Uh, as, as you remember, we had 556 for the first question. There were some people who like dropped out of the survey at, like mid, like halfway before they even got done, didn't finish the survey. But for the people who completed every single question, we still got 528, so we still had our quota there. All right, so we wanted to break down the data a little further to see if there were any relationships we could find within the data. Um, so we started out with a null hypothesis, and the null hypothesis is always going to be that there is no statistically significant relationship between the two sets of data. Um, in order to find the relationship, if there is one, we ran a Pearson's chi-squared test, which is a, a statistical test to uh, see if there's a relationship between two sets of qualitative data. And if we run the test and we get a p-value less than 0 0.05, we can, uh, we can say that there is a statistically significant relationship. So the first one we wanted to find was whether there was a relationship between what college you're in and your level of understanding. Uh, we ran the test, we got a low p-value, so we rejected that null hypothesis. Our alternative hypothesis is yes, there is a relationship between what college you're in and your level of understanding. As you can see here, I highlighted them. The College of Integrated Science and Engineering, they thought they had a very high understanding on the subject, very low amount of people said low. Um, it was the same with the College of Science and Math. They thought they had a, the highest amount of understanding on the subject, probably because a lot of coursework revolves around this subject. Um, and then on the flip side of that, the College of Health and Behavioral Studies, they had the highest total of people who thought that they had the lowest, uh, they had very low understanding. Uh, the second relationship we took a look at was, was there a relationship between what college you're in and whether you think GMOs are safe? Once again, we got a low p-value, we rejected that. So yes, there is a, a significant relationship between what college you're in and whether you think they're safe. Once again, the College of Integrated Science and Engineering, they, overwhelming majority, thought yes, GMOs are safe. Same at the College of Science and Math, they're kind of sticking <coughs> to each other on these. Uh, they thought they were, majority thought they were safe. Flip side of that, College of Health and Behavioral Studies, the majority thought, no, they are not safe. They don't think GMOs are safe. And the same with the College of Visual and Performing Arts. They had the highest total of people who thought they were unsafe. And it was a pretty even split between the rest of the colleges. Uh, for the next two, we wanted to find whether there was a relationship between college and whether you think there's enough information uh, on campus and whether there was a relationship between your level of understanding and whether you think GMOs are safe. Uh, we got a very high p-value on both of these, so we accepted those nulls. There's nothing really to look into any farther on those. And then the final one, we wanted to find whether there was a relationship between their level of understanding and whether they think there's enough information about GMOs in the dining halls. Uh, this was the lowest p-value we got. We can say confidently there's a pretty strong relationship between those. And here it is. So for the people who had a high understanding, 63% of those said yes, there is enough information on campus. For the people who had a low understanding, 69% of them said no, there is not enough information on campus. This makes sense. If you have a high understanding on the subject, you're not going to be really wanting to seek more information. If you don't really know much, then you're probably going to want to see more information regarding the subject around so you can broaden your knowledge on it. And then right dead in the middle, people who uh, had a medium under understanding, 50% <coughs> of them said that they were unsure. And I also pointed out again that, once again, 63% of our participants said no, there's not enough information on campus. Uh, so the takeaways we got from this survey was that there was a dead even split in the JME population on the safety of GMOs. For the people who were concerned about GMOs, uh, long-term human health was of greatest concern. And we also found that JMU students desire more information regarding GMOs. And that concludes the survey, and that takes us into the laboratory section of our project. Okay, so as biotechnology concentrations, it was really important for us to get into the lab and get that hands-on experience that we were looking for. Um, so before we go into the lab results, um, really briefly and really simply, um, how an organism is genetically modified. In this um, image right here, the pink DNA is um, from a bacteria, the green DNA is the corn, and then the yellow DNA is the gene of interest. In this case, it's the BT gene, which Adam mentioned before, um, if a pest goes to eat the plant, they'll die so that it saves the plant from getting, eating, getting eaten by plants. Um, the gene of interest is taken out of the chromosome of the bacteria with enzymes, and then you insert it into the chromosome permanently of um, whatever crop you want to put it in, so corn. Um, in order to get this gene to turn on, so if a gene is in an organism, it has to be turned on before it can 
make the desired product. Um, most often than not, they use the 35S promoter. Um, a promoter basically just turns on the gene, and if we know that, um, a, if we see a promoter when we test the food, we know that it was modified by something. Um, so Adam mentioned that we went to the dining halls to collect food samples. We took 20 food samples. The majority of these are from E-Hall, but um, we did get a veggie burger from SSC so that we could test the difference between that and the one in E-Hall. Um, and then we also took buffalo mash from D-Hub because it's Jamie's favorite. Um, so we tested the chicken breading on the chicken and then the mashed potatoes. And then um, these are all foods that are offered every day. Our laboratory testing was broken up into three sections. Um, DNA isolation was first, so we wanted to extract DNA from the food samples that we had. The second step is polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. Um, what that does is it uh, replicates the DNA a lot so that there's an abundance of DNA so that we can image it. Um, and then the third step is gel electrophoresis. Um, a gel will separate the DNA based on size, so we know what length of DNA we're looking for, so we can see it on our gel. Um, before I show you the results, um, I want to quickly go over what we're looking for. So um, on every single sample, we tested for two things, tubulin and the 35S promoter. Tubulin is something that is found in every single, G um, every single cell. It's involved with the process of mitosis, which is the splitting of cells. Um, and then the 35S, again, is the promoter that if it's inserted, we know that um, it was modified. So um, for a positive result, as you can see on the leftmost image, if both tubulin and 35S show up, then we know that it's positive. Um, for the negative result, you can see that just the tubulin is there, not the 35S. And then this one on the right is an example of if we couldn't isolate DNA for a number of different reasons. Okay, and so these are just four different um, gels that we ran. We had 17 total, but I wanted to point out a couple of things on these gels. Um, on arrow number one, you can see our positive and negative control. For every um, round that we did, we wanted to make sure that there was a positive and negative control to make sure that our PCR worked and that um, everything was good and nothing was contaminated. At um, arrow number two, that is our french fry sample. As you can see, there's no DNA that we could isolate. Um, we think it's because potatoes are very starchy, so it's hard to get that DNA out. Um, arrow number three is our tortilla chip. As you can see, both the tubulin and the 35S are present, so that's positive. Arrow number four is corn. It's a little bit hard to see in the sliding, but just the tubulin band is there, not the 35S, so, that, so we know that's negative. And then um, for number five, our water controls. We wanted to make sure that um, the reagents that we were using weren't contaminated. So with water controls, we didn't add any food DNA, and we didn't want to see any bands come up, because if they did come up, then we know that um, something was contaminated. But as you can see, no bands came up, so we were all set in the lab. Okay, so this is just a chart showing every single food sample we had, the number of times it came up positive, the number of times it came up negative, and the number of valid trials that we had. Um, for the green samples, those are the ones that came up positive consistently. Um, for the red samples, those are the ones that came up <coughs> negative, so no GMOs. And then this yellow sample, like I mentioned before, the french fry, we were unable to isolate DNA. Um, and now this is put uh, much more easily to read. Um, so we had four samples that came up consistently positive. Pizza crust, the chicken breading off of buffalo mash, tortilla chips, and the M&M cookie. We had five samples that, did, that consistently came up as not containing GMOs, corn, peas, vegan chicken strips, the veggie burger from E-Hall, and granola. Um, like I mentioned before, French fry, we were unable to isolate DNA. And then these 10 samples over here were inconclusive. We aren't um, comfortable saying whether they are or are not genetically modified. Um, it could be for several different reasons. Sometimes um, a food sample would come up positive once and negative the next. Um, that could be for a number of different reasons. Um, experimental error or contamination in the dining halls. Um, and then for hummus and potato chip um, especially, those are very oily foods, so we couldn't isolate DNA enough times to say conclusively whether they contained or did, sorry, <laughs> my voice just cracked, contained or did not contain GMOs. So from all of our data from the survey and the laboratory testing, we from the beginning said that we were a partner with Aramark and Jamie Dining Services which we met with them to share a list of recommendations of what the students really want and we can tell them exactly 
what they should do about GMS. So our main recommendation for Airmark is that there will be more educational resources to highlight what GMMs are and how they are created. <coughs> more, more, more education could be a variety of different areas, uh, from having like a brochure that we could hand out to having different tables in front of eHall that says exactly what a GMO is and how it is created, or even having on the TV screens more information too. We figure that if we correct, uh, that if we have more information, more education resources for everybody, that we could correct the common misconceptions regarding GMOs. Because as you saw, over like 78% of our survey data so that they have, are very concerned about long-term human health. The reason why we said more education, uh, mainly for two reasons. The first is that our survey said that 63% of people do not think that there is enough information, so that's very telling. And another reason was this is the most feasible plan for Airmark and <coughs> JMU Dining Services, because if you were to do other options, it's very hard to actually like enact those things. So for more education, you can do a variety of what I just stated, and that's fairly simple to do. So from this meeting with Airmark, they were extremely uh, receptive to our information. They were very willing to accommodate the, what we recommended and implement it in a variety of different ways. They were also, for everybody here, extremely willing and wanting to collaborate with future ISAT students and other generations to implement these changes, which would make a great project. <laughs> So finally, from these recommendations, we actually go to our final project's conclusions, which we separate into our three different areas. Um, so once again, for the survey, found that JMU students do not believe there is enough information regarding GMOs on campus, and they'd like to see more. Um, for the laboratory testing, out of our 20 samples, we had consistent results for about 10 of them. And then of those 10, um, it was split evenly among which were modified and which were not. And finally, our data analysis and recommendation was there to be more information regarding GMOs around JMU's campus, and Airmark was extremely willing and receptive to that information. So because our project had such a wide breadth and depth into the biotechnology field and GMOs, we said that there are many future impacts that go along with it. The first, of course, is the Safe and Accurate Food Labeling Act, which we don't know positively what will, that will happen with that but most likely it does not affect Airmark or JMU Dining Services, but it will affect the pipeline for the food to get to them. So that was something that we wanted to consider for the future. Uh, so there's new, new technologies under development and they're coming out all the time for genetic modification, making it quicker and easier. Uh, I'm sure you guys have heard of CRISPR. I mean, that's a new one that's coming out that's gonna make this, this subject even more prominent in the future because it's gonna be way easier to <coughs> modify. And for the future of this project, we think that this is a great um, project for ISAT students to continue in the future um, because it, of its cross-disciplinary nature. Um, we focus on policy, cultural dynamics, and laboratory hard science. Um, so we think this is perfect for ISAT students to continue. And these are the people we would like to thank. Uh, big shout out to our advisors, Dr. Biesker and Dr. Conley, as well as Airmark and Jamie Dining Services. Without them, none of this would have been possible. And that's all we got for you guys. Some stories and then our questions. Thank you. We have time for questions. Alright. <laughs> Any questions? I'll try one but this is this is probably gonna come a little odd. Um, you made a choice to to uh, divide your survey participants into two categories, ones that thought GMO food was safe and you skipped a question, right? Is that yes, yes, correct. Remember? And one that thought it was unsafe. What about the people who think they're safe but don't like them? I happen to be in that category. <laughs> I missed it. And so I was wondering if, uh, if there was a way to, to correct for that. The reason I don't like them, just to let everybody know, is that I think the corporate control of food is really bad. And GMOs actually allow patenting of food so that there is total corporate control over the seed, which is the genetic right. thing, which up until this century, nobody could patent the seed. And so I'm wondering if you're getting at the, that ethical side of it at all in your, in your we, study. We weren't really going into the ethics of it. We were more worried about whether people thought they were safe or unsafe. Do you think there is a role for that? Oh, absolutely. That's something else people could go into in future projects. Definitely. We, we did have a question level. of saying, and that also saying, uh, Flip back to that thing. yeah, there were many, 
There are many uh, different <laughs> answers, but where is it? <coughs> is this the, which one is it? <coughs> so right here, there's um, economic mono monopoly, genetic diversity, not enough research on long-term human health. So we did. So I guess what you're talking about is the economic yeah. monopoly. Well, this this question was the one that was only asked to half the population of your survey. Correct. Right. right. We so thought GMOs were. We did that on purpose, though, yeah. uh, because if we were not to do that, they would come across as we were being biased towards that they are not safe. So that's why we did the skip logic. That we were advised from that from a couple of people. They said do a skip logic. Dr. Beezer especially said because if you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what it was. She, she just said, I dug this point up in her class. She, she actually taught us how to do that, though, so that's why. You were trying to put me under the bus. It would, it would seem biased if, we're, if we were asking the people who thought GMOs were a great thing and they were safe, if we immediately asked them why, why they thought they, they were bad. I mean, uh, we seem, that would seem yeah, biased in that's our That's why I'm an odd person out on this, but I, but I think there is a category of people that you might find that I, I'm not alone. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah, I, I, I think we would agree. <laughs> really great presentation, you guys. My questions are probably going to reveal how ignorant I am. <laughs> um, and they're related. So is, is it 35S is what you were talking about? Yes. So I had never heard, is all genetic modification always has 35S? Not or? always. Um, that's the most common one. So that's the one that we were testing for here. There are other promoters that could be used that we didn't test for. So that is something so to take into consideration. So there could be some that were showing negative for that that might have some Yes. Yeah. And then sort of related to that, you know, in the beginning of the presentation, you were talking about the policies and how some of the court cases hinged on whether it was materially same or different. And then I was kind of wondering by the end of the presentation what that means, because you are testing for something that it seems to me is materially different, <laughs> but the conclusions are that it's materially the same. So I was wondering, maybe from a scientific perspective, maybe it's different than what the court perspective is, or if you have some... Yes. So, um, what a promoter is, it's a, it's a piece of DNA that encodes for a protein that will turn the gene on, um, but the makeup of the DNA is just what every DNA is made up of. So, those four basic nucleotides, um, and then the protein that is made from it is just made up of things that are already being made in the cells. So, um, do you have anything? Yeah, I could, I could touch on that. Uh, a lot of times the, the court is saying that it's not significantly different and they rest on the significant part so and there's a different function so it, it doesn't change the exact function or it'd be like a salmon would walk on land that would they consider would be a function. It doesn't you know? change the structure. Yeah, it doesn't change the structure corn of it. It's still a piece of corn. It just, yeah. has that motor. it just has different characteristics and qualities that are a little bit different. They're not drastically. Most of the time you see like herbicide resistant like we said or the um, it would kill different insects or pests. That's the majority. So yeah, it, it is kind of it is a gray area. That's why there are so many. There was like a, a court case, and then there was a lot. There was many different things that built up to the final the uh, labeling stuff. Thanks. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.